Hi, welcome to Bookmark. I'm your host, Don Noble. Today's guest is Stephen Trout. Stephen Trout is a historian, literary critic, specializing in America's 20th century wars. His most recent book is The Vietnam Veterans Memorial at Angel Fire. I spoke with Stephen Trout in Studio A in the Digital Media Center on the campus of the University of Alabama. Steve, it's good to see you. Good to see you. I sometimes thank people for traveling long distances at a, with great trouble and expense to come, to come and sit and do this show, but you've come from across the street. I have. From, from what we used to know as Morgan Hall. We'll get back to that, as in names and memorials. Okay. But <clears throat> you just finished two years. Here's what I know. You finished two years as chairman of the English department. And I know you were at South Alabama before that. And otherwise, I know very little about you. Where are you from? Where were you educated? Where have you worked? Well, I grew up in Kansas City, Missouri. And I went to the University of Missouri, Kansas City for my bachelor's degree and my master's. And then uh, wound up at KU for my doctorate. Uh, applied all over the world uh, once I completed my PhD and wound up in the state of Kansas. Um, I spent 18 years at a regional teaching campus called Fort Hayes State University, which as they say in Kansas, is out there. Now, under normal circumstances, a person would never have heard of Fort Hayes, but Ralph Voss yes. was there and yes. taught there yes. and was here for years and years. Yes. And he was so fond of it, in fact, that he returned there and taught summer school from time to time at Fort Hayes. He did. We had a summer in-service MA program for full-time mm -hmm, teachers, mm -hmm. and Ralph would come every summer and, and teach a course. Uh, I, he, a good friend of mine, and I knew him years before I had any idea that I would wind up in Alabama. Wonderful man. Probably years before he <laughs> even. <laughs> but anyway, he, he was here. We're all here. In that mini biography, all right, let, me, let me back myself up. You've written thousands and thousands of words about war. Mm -hmm. Have you been in the service? Were you in the service? And what did you do? No, I'm, I'm not, no. A, not a veteran. I've, no. I've never served in the military. But you developed a powerful interest, not so much in strategy and tactics, battlefield stuff, mm -hmm. but in war and society, war and culture, war and its and the perceptions of war. When did that evolve and, and why? I think it evolved when I was in my teens and it was largely a result of talking with my father. Uh, my father was not a veteran either, but he was a ninth grade social studies teacher. And so he would, uh, he would come home from work and because he dealt with ninth graders all day, he needed a few hours to recover. But, but once he could finally interact with uh, family members, he would talk about what he had covered in his classes that day. And um, my interest in the First World War specifically, I can, I can pinpoint that exactly when, when I became so captivated by World War I. Uh, it was an evening when he was talking about a unit that he had taught on trench warfare uh, on the Western Front from 1914 to 1918. And that image of this, this, these opposing belts of trenches uh, divided by no man's land that stretched for over 400 miles all the way from the North Sea to the Swiss border. Um, that, that, just, that, that just, I found that enthralling and, and, and fascinating. And I think my, my interest in World War I specifically began at that moment. Mm -hmm. And then uh, later in my life, as I became a student of literature and cultural studies, that's when I really started to think about war in those terms. Um, I've never been particularly interested in operational history. Um, a lot of military history bores me, quite frankly. I'm not interested in, in why one particular side wins a particular battle or where the individual units move or anything like that. I'm interested in, in warfare experientially and culturally and how it's processed by a society and, right. and remembered. Right. Yeah. 
<clears throat> after, after Fort Hayes, though, you did spend a considerable amount of time in Mobile, in South Alabama. Did. And did you start up the, what is the institute there for, oh, for the study of? Yeah, I became the co-director of a center uh, called the Center for the Study of War and Memory. And it's the only center in the world that focuses specifically on war remembrance. Uh, there are other centers that focus on war in society, war in culture. There are other centers that focus on um, uh, memory studies in general. But this is the only one to look specifically at, at remembrance of armed conflict. And so I established that while I was uh, at the University of South Alabama. Uh, I co-directed it with a, a, a dear friend and a great colleague, uh, Professor Susan McCready, uh, who's a French professor at USA. And when I took the job here at UA, I had a, a wonderful conversation with um, Dean Messina, the Dean of the College of Arts and Sciences, and he indicated that he would be interested in uh, perhaps establishing the center here at the University of Alabama as a collaboration with the University sure. of South Alabama. And so that's what I hope is going to happen. And you, you have workshops, you have conferences, you have publications? We have a, we have a uh, conference coming up in February, in fact, mm -hmm. uh, that's called Experiencing War Memorials, uh, colon, um, Feeling, Place, and Public Memory. And uh, we're putting together the, the program for that conference right now. And then I edited a book series for the University of Alabama Press uh, called War, Memory, and Culture, and that has been affiliated with the center. Um, so yes, we have a number of projects associated with it. World War I. In over, over many, many years, I've taught lots of books yeah. <laughs> that come out of World War I. And they're, they're you know, some of them more direct, like uh, Farewell to Arms, some less direct, Sun Also Rises, some oblique, <laughs> Tender is the Night, uh, the Gats and Gatsby, and so on. But generally, and then there's always, there's always Elliot and Pound and the Wasteland. And I have to say that I was, I was pretty well convinced that what most people thought about World War I was that it was a unmitigated catastrophe, killed hundreds of, a million people, say, maybe it was a million, right? About, about nine million. Oh, nine million. About oh, well nine then. Nine million, yeah. yeah. I underestimate the catastrophe yeah. and that the, that the 20s, were therefore powerfully influenced by it, and everybody thought of it that way. But I've just read a, a, a good deal of your writing about World War I. Apparently that was not the only opinion, the wasteland position, that it was a, a, a castrating, culturally castrating disaster. Other people thought about it differently. They thought about it quite differently, and my conclusions about the American cultural response to the First World uh -huh. War um, if we were talking about this, say, 20 years ago, would have been very much in line, I, I think, with, with the generalizations that you just offered. And then I really started doing research. Um, I started looking beyond the familiar canonical works of American literature that engage with the war to look at other things and to get a sense of what people were actually reading and what kinds of texts were in circulation. And I also started looking at how various American subcultures that I felt were particularly important, like the American Legion, yes. uh, which was an enormously influential veterans organization uh, founded in 1919, right after the First World War. I started looking at how members of the American Legion processed their memories of the war, how they made sense of them, and uh, how they defined that experience. And I realized that, that there are a lot of competing views. Um, that, that the version of literary and cultural history that, that you and I inherited um, is, is somewhat one-dimensional. Uh, there were a lot of Americans who felt, go back to the Legion for a moment, um, I read American Legion magazines until I nearly went blind, uh, the American Legion Weekly, the American Legion Monthly, I traced these all the way through the 20s and 30s for a book I wrote some years ago. And what's interesting about the way that the, that the Legionnaires processed their memory of World War I is that many of them became isolationist in the, in the 20s and 30s, wow. which would be in line with the sort of disillusioning aftermath of the war that you and I are familiar with. But at the same time, they saw their experience in World War I as being uh, central to their masculinity. And, and their war experience had made them, uh, in their view, uh, re real men and real patriots. 
And so I, what I found so interesting about the Legion memory of the First World War was that in some respects, politically, it reflected that narrative of, of disillusionment. But in other ways, um, simultaneously, there were things about their experience that they found um, uh, ennobling um, and that they celebrated. So it's a complicated All right. picture. How, <clears throat> how would you uh, connect the idea of romanticizing the war? How would you not connect, but in proportions, people romanticized it, people thought it was, people was, it was a wasteland, it was a disaster. Obviously, both were going on in the 20s and 30s. Yeah, yeah. And sometimes both are going on in the, in the same literary work. Sure. Uh, if, if you look at something like uh, Willa Cather's One of Ours, which I'm teaching right now, which for a long time was dismissed as this simplistic, sort of neo-romantic, uh, melodramatic rendition of, of World War I. Um, if you look carefully at that text, it, it's, it's, it's offering both of those interpretations at the same time. What one's really layered on, on top of the other, and they're, they're in conflict in that, in that text with one another. That text is partly battlefield text. Indeed. And she was <laughs> a woman from Nebraska living in Manhattan. Right, right. Who, had she ever even been to France? She had been to France many times. And, and prior to World War I. Prior to World yeah. War I, and she went to France right after World War I. She had a first cousin, uh, Grosvenor P. Cather, who was killed at the Battle of Cantini in 1918. And um, as soon as the war was over, she went to find his grave and to photograph it and to report back to, to his parents. Um, so she had a direct um, connection to a, to a family loss in the war. She interviewed uh, dozens, maybe even hundreds of, of veterans. And so uh, I, think, I think one of ours is a problematic uh, novel in some respects, and it's a novel that reflects, in, in some places, Cather's lack of immediate war experience, but in, it's also extremely well-researched. And, you know, Hemingway was very critical of it. Oh, yes. Um, in a world where one is supposed to write about what one knows. Indeed, a, indeed. A person f from uh, Red Bluff, Red... <laughs> Red Cloud. Red Cloud, Red Cloud Nebraska. Nebraska. Yeah, yeah. A woman from yeah. Red Cloud, Nebraska, yeah. who never spent a minute yeah. in World War I, yeah. seemed yeah. to Hemingway like the last person in the world who should even attempt it. Right. But she won the Pulitzer Prize. She, she did, and, and I, think, um, uh, I think Hemingway... Um, you know, Hemingway exaggerated his own war experience. Um, oh, yes. he, he served in the Red Cross, not in the Italian army, as he oh, later yes. claimed. And then don't forget that in A Farewell to Arms, Hemingway has that, that incredible section dealing with the retreat from Caporetto, which he did not witness. That, that took place an entire year before he served that in Italy. That was a brilliant yeah. piece of research. Yeah. Which yeah. it really was. Yeah. I mean, he had maps and diaries and, yeah. Yeah. and journals. He, 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 and, did, and, he did for yeah. Caporetto what Cather did for the trenches. Yeah, and yeah. I, would, I would argue both of these writers were, were basing a large portion of those works on research. In generality, in a, in a generality, we, we speak about veterans of World War II didn't talk about it. Was that true for veterans of World War I? Was it unspeakable? I, I'm not sure that it's true for either group no, no, of, no. of veterans. <laughs> yes, right. <laughs> I, I think we, we tend I to- I say make, we say it. <laughs> well, uh, yeah, yeah, we, yeah. We, we do. And we, we tend to have that sort of stereotype of, of World War II veterans. But, but I, I've known World War II veterans who talk about nothing else um, other, other than their, their experience. And I think it's hard to generalize about, about um, how American veterans after World War I process that experience. I think there's one significant difference, though, between these two groups of veterans that I think really influences their outlook. World War I, World War I veterans, um, in, in terms of financial reward or social mobility or, or job training or educational benefits, they, they got very little yeah. out of this experience. You know, 60 bucks and a rail ticket was pretty much what you got for serving in the American Expeditionary Forces. Right. World War II veterans come out really empowered by the Servicemen's Readjustment Act of 1944 that, that, that creates our, really the middle class as we know it. Uh, so I think those are profound differences. Yeah, the whole, the, the housing loans, the GI Bill, and the respect, it was the good war. World War I might have been possibly the good war. 
Vietnam. No one yet has called Vietnam the good war. Well, <laughs> may, anyway, may, maybe the North Vietnamese who won that conflict <laughs> might see it that way, but, but then their, their losses were astronomical. You know, I want to go there, but there were two little things, no, not so little, but two, two bits about World War I that I found really interesting in, in, in one of your essays. Truman, who was an artillery captain, he didn't see a lot of hand-to-hand -hand combat, but he learned that he could lead men. Yes. And he became president of the United States. Yes. Eisenhower did the guidebook mm -hmm. to the battlefields of World War I. Mm -hmm. And, and uh, how and valuable that turned out to be. And, and Eisenhower never heard a shot fired in anger yeah. in World War I. He never, made, he never made it overseas as right. part of the American Expeditionary Forces. But then he becomes attached to the American Battle Monuments Commission yes. in the 20s, and he becomes uh, an expert on, on uh, you know, where the armies moved on the battlefield and, and what had happened where. And it was really an authority on that. Yeah, and how handy to have someone who really, really knew the territory. And then he becomes, of course, Supreme Allied Commander and, yes. and so on. But your newest book, um, Angel Fire, is about, a, is about a war, it's about memor a memorial, it's about a family, it's, I can see why it would have taken a while to get a hold of all the stuff that's in that book. It's, it's complicated. We had on campus with Phil Beidler, one of the real national experts on Vietnam from, from a particular point of view, especially the literature of Vietnam. Well, he was the father of Vietnam War literature study in the oh, United I think States. So. He wrote the yes. first major study on that subject that came out in the, in the early 80s. Yeah. You and he must have talked about Angel Fire and Vietnam. We did. We, we did. We did. We did. I, I, as was the case with Ralph Voss, I knew Phil for years before I knew I would ever be working at the oh. University of Alabama <laughs> Press. All right. How, in term, I, I think I know the answer. I'm never sure of these things, but romanticization, wasteland, other feelings? How do we feel about Vietnam? It's been a while. Have we settled down? Is there a national, um, a national uh, position now? Do we, how do we feel about it? We well, lost. We acknowledge that we lost. Right? I, think, I, think it's, um, I think it's so distant in time from so many Americans. Mm -hmm. I, I guess I'm, when, when I talk with people about the Vietnam War, there are two things that really strike me. One is, is just how far removed so many Americans are from that conflict now. Mm -hmm. And secondly, the lack of resolution that we have all these years later. Um, I, I don't think there is a consensus in the United States on the meaning of the Vietnam War. Um, I think that many of the memorials that, that were copycat designs, basically, the, the wall-style memorials that sprang up all over the United States uh, after um, the, the dedication of the National Vietnam Veterans Memorial in, in 1982, um, they don't grapple with the meaning of the war. They, they simply provide a, uh, a list of names, yes. and they ask the viewer to honor the service of, of, of those participants. Um, without really getting into the into the moral and, and social and political questions that, that the war raises, and 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 personally, I, I think if 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 one wants to see evidence that that we as a society have largely ignored the lessons of the Vietnam War, simply look at our 21st century conflicts and um, you know the experience in Iraq, for example, which echoed Vietnam in so many disturbing ways and seemed to reflect that we hadn't really processed that war or reflected on it perhaps in the way that we should. Yes, when you it, it go into other people's country where they live, yeah. you are going to have a hard time of it, whether it's yeah. Iraq yeah. or Afghanistan or wherever it is. Yeah. But precisely, the book, more, more, more directly, what is the memorial at Angel Fire? There is, a, there is a, a dead Marine officer, his grieving father, and a memorial. Why and how? What's, what's the story there? Well, the memorial itself is a non-denominational chapel, mm -hmm. and it was created by a family in New Mexico, uh, the, the Westfalls, yeah. uh, to honor David Westfall, the, the oldest son in that family, who was killed in Vietnam in 1968. Um, the family decided very quickly that, that the memorial would have a three-pronged mission. 
Uh, it would honor David's memory. Uh, it also would honor all American servicemen and women, the living and the dead, who had been involved in the Vietnam War. And then third, it would be uh, an urgent call for world peace. And so it's a, it's a complicated, multi-layered memorial <laughs> that was inevitably going to be controversial um, because it appealed, I think, to both the left and the right, uh, to both the hawks and the doves in a way, in the, in the discussion of the war. Um, it was established in 1968. It was dedicated in 1972. Uh, this John, is all well ahead of all, Washington. All well ahead, uh, more, more than 10 years ahead. Yeah. Uh, John Kerry, who was the spokesperson for the Vietnam veterans against uh, yes, the war, yes. uh, he gave the, the main address at the dedication ceremony in, in 1972. Um, and this became really between, between 72 and 82, when you get the memorial in Washington, D.C., this is the de facto National Vietnam Veterans Memorial. And you've seen it? Many, many times. Is it as stunning as in a sense, breathtaking with its white kind of eagle's wing yeah. shape as it appears in these pictures? More so. It is. More so. And it's, and it's a very different, it, it reflects a very different variety of visual rhetoric than, than, than the wall does in D.C. Yes. Uh, the wall is, is just, uh, just annihilating with, with that, that column after column of names. And what people forget about, about the wall, or people don't understand who haven't been there, is you, you descend into it. So you're, you're going into kind of a, of a, of a tomb-like uh, setting, whereas this is on uh, the, the top of a hill that overlooks the Moreno Valley. Uh, the architecture draws your eye upward. Yes. So it's a, it's a site that's symbolic of loss, but it also is a site that, that, that I think leaves you with an impression of hope. Um, some, some hope to, to, an, to an end to war. But it's religious certain... monuments have always drawn the eye always towards heaven. Always. I mean, that's the whole idea of the spire of, yeah. The, yeah. of, the, of the church steeple. Yeah, that's right. And In contrast with the wall, which is so yes. relentlessly horizontal. Right, right, right. He had a, the fellow who, the father, the bereaved father, sank, sank his entire fortune into building this. And could not find federal support. I mean, he had a terrible time. And one of the things in your book is he made an announcement at one point that <clears throat> if he could find the name and even the photograph of the North Vietnamese soldier who killed his boy, he would put that photograph yes. in the chapel as well. Yes. This is not going to go well with um, the Department of Defense. Well, it didn't, it didn't go well with a lot of people. And he made that comment when he was interviewed by a British journalist, uh, Michael Satchel, uh, in 1979 for a piece that appeared in Parade magazine. And um, Parade, um, uh, you and I are both old enough to remember, that was kind of a, a, a arts and culture weekly that went into Sunday editions of newspapers all over the country. So it was read by, oh, yeah. by millions of, yeah. of people. And um, when I went through, there, there's a vast archival holding for this memorial. Uh, Doc Westfall, the, the primary founder of the memorial, had a PhD uh, from the University of New Mexico in American Civilization, so he was trained as a scholar, and uh, he kept every piece of paper that ever passed through his fingers. And Good for you. Good for me. So when I went to the Vietnam Center at Texas Tech, when I was researching this book, I went through 45 boxes of uncatalogued materials. Uh -huh. um, but. You know, he, he made the, when he made that comment about putting the, the picture of the, of the North Vietnamese soldier on the wall, um, it, it, it offended uh, many of the parents of American fatalities who felt that was inappropriate. There were Vietnam veterans who, who wrote to the, the family to, to express their objections. And again, I looked at all of these materials. But there were also people who, who praised that gesture who said that's really in keeping with, with, with the third primary theme of the memorial, the which is peace. to peace, moving beyond right. nationality. Right. Yeah. yeah. Well, the book, the memorial, the book, the father, it, it is an amazing collection of contradictions because the son at the time of his death was very, very much in favor of the war. A absolutely. And the father was vague and then basically became very negative about the war. We are in a moment now, I get books uh, uh, in the mail to review on 
our present day struggle with memorials. We're taking down Nathan Bedford Forrest. We're taking down mostly Robert E. Lee. They're moving. Andrew Jackson is done. Or Stonewall Jackson, <laughs> rather, is done. Mm -hmm. They're moving towards... Probably Andrew Jackson as well. <laughs> they're moving towards, yes, for different reasons. For different reasons. And they're moving towards Washington and Lincoln for different reasons again. Is it, this is what Americans do. We kind of shift and change our minds about things. You're an expert on memorials. <laughs> what well, about it? My, my, my thinking on this has really changed over the last few decades. Um, I, I used to take the position that that eliminating public sta eliminating public memorials to um, people who don't meet our contemporary standards in terms of their outlook on race or gender or whatever it may be, sure, sure. Um, my feeling was that that's, that's quote unquote white, whitewashing history where we're sort of, rem you know, maybe we need to be reminded that our society has been shaped by views we may find abhorrent. Um, but I've really sort of now come around to a different position and, and I think that a public memorial is a, is a, is a public object. It, it should reflect the values of, of the community that, that it, it serves in a, in a sense. And if those values um, are, are such that um, the primary achievements of the person being commemorated um, are, are no longer highly regarded, then I don't think you keep that memorial up. I don't think you destroy it, uh, but you move it to a space, <laughs> yeah. uh, 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 perhaps at a museum, uh, where you can historicize it and explain who this person was and, and when this memorial was created and why. Yeah. You know, it's been pointed out that so many of these Confederate memorials were erected at times when, um, you know, there, there was a particular effort, uh, you know, to, to keep uh, African Americans in the South uh, from, from being able to participate in the political process. And so the history of so many of these uh, memorials to Confederate figures is intertwined with, with the history of the Jim Crow South and with and the period they after Reconstruction. in 1910. Absolutely. Yeah, I mean, Absolutely. That, those, yeah. those are not too yeah. controversial. So, so if you have a memorial to someone, um, and um, a, a significant percentage of your, of your community population is offended by that, why would you keep it up? That, I, that, that just I do doesn't, not know the answer. Yeah, that, that, that does not make sense to me. Well, you are a hard-working writer, no question about it. What are you doing now? We have less than a minute. I'm writing a book about a troop ship, uh, the SS Tuscania, which was torpedoed in 1918. It was the only troop ship carrying American soldiers in World War I to be torpedoed uh, by a U-boat. And so I'm telling the story of the sinking of the vessel, and then I'm tracing the history of the commemoration of that event all the way from 1918 to 2018. Oh, okay. And it did not precipitate the war. It did not get us into the war. Not to be confused it was with a... <laughs> other vessels. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Thank you. Well, I'll look forward to that. Great. And this has been a pleasure. Thank you for coming in. My pleasure. Great talking with you.